more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Avia Arika, a crypto advocate, blockchain lawyer, someone who's challenging the status quo so that we can make this the future of finance. Avia, such a pleasure to have you today. How are you doing? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, the first question I really want to ask you is why did you jump into this nightmare world in terms of regulatory frameworks of the crypto and decentralized space? What is your story? As you said, most people prefer stability and certainty. I, uh, I prefer action and the, the unknown. So um, I always chose uh, the territories that are a bit uh, um, less explored. Uh, I felt... You know, big decisions you make with your heart, I believe. So uh, I just felt an attraction. I came from a background that was sort of like the cousin of uh, working with crypto companies. I was working with a lot of financial services and online gaming companies, and mostly um, with everything that has to do with global structures and financial regulation, gaming regulation, bank accounts for companies that are considered high risk. Uh, so it was very natural to me that transition because the infrastructure that I was using then uh, is very much using me today with crypto companies. Uh, and crypto just felt uh, like a more fresh territory for me, uh, less mature, uh, more moldable. And for me, it's very interesting because uh, we're looking to help shape the, the, the industry and not just, uh, you know, be robots and file paperwork. Uh, so beyond the fact that I'm uh, technology and finance and them meeting each other is something that I find very interesting. Glad you're pushing the space forward. But one of the most critical questions when it comes to the legal side of things is which countries as of today are the most crypto friendly in terms of laws, regulations and guidelines? Please bring us up to speed, Avia. Um, I would like to start with Australia, actually. I think Australia is... Um, uh sort of we ignore it sometimes but it's a very big market its proximity to china and all of the uh asian countries is is what's enriching it even more because uh, as you know asian people they're very advanced in terms of crypto and a lot of them immigrate to australia so australia is a very lucrative and interesting market and actually the regulator there um, there are two financial regulators in Australia. One of them is the big one, ASIC. Uh, it's the one regulating the heavier financial licenses, market licenses, broker licenses, banks, etc. And then you have something called Austrac, which is sort of like the anti-money laundering authority there. And a few years ago, they decided to create um, a very uh, um, straightforward regime for crypto exchanges um, with Austrac. So they distinguish between crypto exchanges that just looking to do to uh, provide buy sell features no trading and they send them to the easier regulator to Austrac and the process is very straightforward um, and I would say it's very achievable even for startups in terms of budget and requirements I personally obtained a few of them during 2019 and I'm now in the process of three more in 2020 um, they're very efficient they um, understand crypto uh, the banks are not even antagonized towards it um, you know, there, there's a big problem in some jurisdictions that the regulator can be very uh, welcoming towards crypto, but the banks are in a whole different sphere. And you yeah. take Estonia as an example, right? Estonia mm -hmm. has been crypto friendly since, what, uh, four or five years ago, yeah. but the banks in Estonia are practically impossible. Uh, mm -hmm. They say maybe that they are welcoming crypto, but they're too busy or just too slow to handle the, 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 the requirements. And in Australia... It's fairly straightforward to open a bank account uh, for a crypto exchange. 
Um, of course, that if you want to off offer in Australia heavier trading features, then that requires a heavier license. But I think that this distinguished distinction between the simple model and the trading model is a very important one. And there's no reason to enforce the same regulation on both of them, which can be very heavy in other jurisdictions. Uh, in terms of Europe, I think that... Um, well, you know, Estonia started very friendly, very welcoming, very easy. Today, they're already, uh, the requirements have become stricter. They are still mm -hmm. friendly towards it, but the requirements and what it takes to get a license in Estonia today are incomparable to the way, uh, uncomparable to the way they were. Um, so it's a different budget. It's a different um, um, uh, effort that's required. Uh, I think, well, of course, Liechtenstein, and I was also present uh, in the, I was hosted by the Liechtenstein ambassador to the UN in October to speak about their new blockchain act and the way they're going to enforce it. Uh, and I think it's a very wise act. Uh, the thing is that uh, similarly to the UK, for example, and to Germany, all of these countries they published the regimes, but the actual guidelines about the implementation remain unclear. And that's a big mm -hmm. problem right now, as I see it. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective because crypto friendliness is not just about the regulators, but it's also about the banks, right? Everything needs to be crypto friendly. So the next question I'd like to ask you is, you know, in 2018, early 2019, it was the death of the utility tokens. And all of a sudden, everyone was like, it's all about security tokens. But that obviously fell on its face. It didn't really happen. What were the problems? What hindered the progress? And this is, is this still the hype or is this still the future that most people are looking forward to? Yeah. Okay. Let me put it like this. Um, ICOs came to our life as sort of a free ticket to uh, startup financing. Right, so there was no actual regulation. People were raising money, a lot of scams. And then people became very skeptical towards uh, funds raising through tokens. Yeah. Now, what happened is that the market shift uh, shifted in the direction of STOs. But when the market shifted into the direction of STOs, it meant that we're relying on the same regulation. So what did everybody mm -hmm. do? They made they they offered private placements based on exemptions on the existing securities laws. So you took an innovative fund uh, fundraising mechanism, and again uh, m made it sit on the traditional securities laws infrastructure, and that created dissonance because if you want to be innovative, but you have to rely on the old laws and the old regulations that creates a problem because you're shooting yourself uh, uh, in the foot. So, and parallel to that, people were very skeptical still. People were, yeah. oh, tokens, I don't want to buy tokens. You know, if I'm not getting something real for my money, I don't want to even hear about it. So people are just psychologically biased towards uh, buying tokens today. And that's a shame because uh, I think that some investors are too, to fixed on the idea of receiving equity or receiving debt for their investment. And I think they should be open to the idea that some companies, they have a great product. They have a great idea. Some of maybe some products are, you know what? I have a client that has a great operation already functioning. Now they want to raise some more funds through, uh, through tokens to expand. Their actual operation is not related to blockchain. But why do they want to raise funds through tokens? Because they don't want to be diluted. They truly believe that they have a good product, good operation. They don't want to be diluted by bringing uh, uh, investors into the picture that will take equity. So I think that sometimes the most interesting uh, uh, startups and pro maybe not even startups, companies, uh, just believe in themselves so much, they don't want to be diluted. And then the best solution for them would be actually fundraising through tokens because that allows allows financing without giving out equity or debt. Um, and it's too bad. I think that we need to raise awareness somehow uh, to investors that don't come from the blockchain space to be open towards that. Uh, Via, so beautifully put. So the other question was based on equity rounds and creating that through tokenomics. So rather than doing an ICO and then all of a sudden doing an equity round where sometimes you're diluting the price and the value of the token, why not go from token round to another token round and just make this a fully inclusive platform? I'd love to hear your comments on that because that sounds really interesting. And I'm wondering if this whole mechanism would eventually work one day. 
Well, first of all, you know, value. Value is such a flexible term. Value can be um, joining a company somehow as a token holder without receiving something fungible at first, but just rejoining it to be on the first, uh, you know, among the first uh, uh, believers that will later get benefits and will be, be rewarded when the company succeeds, if it's a very early startup, for example. Or value can be, uh, here are some tokens to buy uh, goods at a discounted rate or to pre-order uh, goods or to get benefits that other people like regular customers of a company don't get. So value is a really flexible term. And I need, again, I think that value uh, investors should be very open to the concept that sometimes value can come not through uh, equity or, or debt. Uh, it can come through all kinds of things that the company can offer inherently, organically, through the product or service that it's providing, not only through the, the, the investment uh, incentives that are uh, acceptable in the investment world traditionally. So yeah, I think value should be uh, um, sort of redefined uh, for investors because we're living in a world where value, value can be data, value can be so many things. Uh, we're evolving today from the idea that only money is value. We're evolving to a more complex idea of value and complex relationships in the business world. So uh, that's that's very important, I think. Wow, you're such a visionary. And you're so cool compared to all the boring lawyers I'm usually talking to. <laughs> But one question I'd love to ask you is, you know, a lot of the geeks or the people who are really into decentralization are kind of like code is law. We don't need lawyers and all those kind of things, but are also really pro DeFi as of this year. It's one of the massive topics, you know, no KYC, non-custodial, completely open, neutral and all these arguments. What is your what are your views on the DeFi projects in terms of sustainability, in terms of infrastructure? How do you feel about this phenomenon as of today? <laughs> Well, uh, some of the DeFi supporters maybe will not. Listen, I think that the DeFi concept is a great concept. But right now, uh, you know, I'm a Taurus, so I'm more realistic. I'm on the pragmatic side. So I got to say that if you want to play in the, in, the, in the big pond today and you want liquidity and you want significant amounts of users, you have to, uh, you have to be accountable. So, so everywhere you go today, you can't be a serious company without being accountable somehow. So if you have no accountability, you can't really grow because you're gonna, you're gonna bump into very hard walls. Um, for example, I got a, um, a call from this guy I know and he told me, listen, I've been supporting this decentralized project for a um, few years now. And you know, at first we were like the first supporters and we were like investing and getting the tokens for it. And we have a legal opinion even that the, that the, that the tokens are utility tokens. And, you know, we have everything that's needed, but it's really decentralized. I told him, okay, then if it's decentralized, then why are you calling me? Why are uh, you issuing a legal opinion? It's not really decentralized because there's a group of people behind it steering the wheel. So he said, we want to promote it now. We want to do business development. We decided that to make more money out of it, we want to develop it into a B2B a software service. So you see, there always come a point where the project to make some more money and to position itself in a more center position in the market will need to uh, put a board of directors to be accountable somehow, to put money in. And you can't really do it, as I see it today, in a very decentralized way because you're going to always bump into the same walls of the KYC and of the regulation. And if you want to get a, a license, even though you're not custodial, you decentralize, people will not trust you because they say, okay, what happens if the technology breaks down or if there's a hack or if there's something, who, who can I sue? Who will I hold accountable if I, hold, if I lose my money? So also users, most users are looking for the accountability. And that's why I think that you can't really grow today if you're truly decentralized. Yeah, yeah I'm with you 100% on that. Although I do prefer DeFi by far in terms of philosophy and transparency, I definitely wouldn't put all of my money into it simply because we still need to audit the smart contracts more, make sure that the systems are robust. Uh, although I'd love to put all my money just like on a savings account at a bank, but I still think we need a little more maturity. We're still in the infancy stages.
So how about you, Avia? Like, what would you personally use for lending and earning interest? Would you use a centralized platform that may have insurance policies or a decentralized platform that is fully transparent but uses smart contracts? What is your overall preference? Well, the idea of conducting trustless transactions is a main idea behind blockchain and crypto payments. There's no doubt about it. But today we still live in a world I believe you can't detach yourself from your, from the environment, the world you live in. We still live in a world that's based on centralized system. If you're going to try and rely on a decentralized system inside that world, it'll probably be a smaller, weaker system, and your chances that something will go wrong are much higher. So today, until the infrastructure grows for those kinds of businesses and people are more receptive towards it, I think it's not the time yet. But I hope it will be in a few years. Yeah, it's just not there yet. I agree. Um, so another topic, we talked about Europe, we talked about Estonia, we talked about Australia, now transitioning to the behemoth, the United States. We know that the United States, in terms of actual transaction volume, the US dollar is king, according to CryptoCompare.com. So a lot of people are interested in crypto assets, but the laws are still very conservative. It's very difficult to qualify as a utility token. And, and basically everything is a security there in the U.S. Uh, I would love to hear your views. How is the U.S. as of today? Are things getting better? How do you see the future there? Mm, it's, I don't see it uh, differently from other markets like the, the, the traditional finan financial markets or so many other markets. And the U.S. market is a very lucrative market. And that's why the regulator there is so strict, right? They want to defend uh, their people, their residents that are sometimes not educated and they don't know what they're spending their money on and how. And so they want to defend them. But still, I think most most startups, if they have the budget, they would think that it's uh, worth the effort to get the regulation in the U.S. to enter that market. So I would separate the ease of regulation from the, uh, let's say, how how much it's worth to enter that market. Um, you know, the fact that the, U the Americans are strict in terms of regulation, that, that's old news. They were always like that. They will continue mm -hmm. to be like that because they have a lot to protect. I guess you're right. You know, their role is to show this power and authority to make sure that, you know, we're not in the wild, wild west and kind of put things back into order. Yeah. You know what? Because they are such a lucrative market and they have a lot of money. The U.S. is a country that's relatively rich, even though they're in uh, 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 terrible deficits. But it's con considered a, a very rich consumer's market. Uh, that's why they don't have the incentives to really go easy on regulation. So if you'll, mm -hmm. you know, if you'll take a closer look, you'll see that countries that go easy on regulation, the regulation are countries that want to attract money into them themselves. And that's why they regulate very uh, easygoing uh, laws to attract startups and attract more business fields. And the U.S. just doesn't have that incentive in many other countries as well. So obviously in the U.S., there's a whole Facebook Libra coin that got the attention of the SEC. But then recently there was, or more recently, there was a Telegram case. Do you feel like the U.S. government was a bit too harsh or the, the measures were a bit too strict on what happened with Telegram? What is your overall take on that? Well, it's a lot of politics, I think. Mm. It's, uh, it's not really about the Telegram, just about the Telegram case. They just knew that everybody would be watching the Telegram case and they wanted to make a point and they wanted people to be afraid to even step, you know, one inch uh, uh, aside the road. Um, and I think that was a big counter uh, factor here um, to turn such a well-communicated case into a show of how you shouldn't mess with Uncle Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a big factor there in my eyes. Uh, mm. Although I, I, I can see the legal logic behind uh, the result, but I can also, I also think it's fairly strict. But again, it's, I'm just not surprised when it comes to the U.S. It's like you can see it's been done with with Facebook and in terms of privacy laws. It's, um, I mean, the U.S. is a country that likes to show their uh, sovereignty over the, the Western world through um, their power to exercise enforcement due to uh, damaging their people, their the U.S. residents um, through financial schemes, etc. So it's a known mechanism and it's just repeating itself again. So I'd love to ask you about the evolution. You know, a lot of people think that Bitcoin will be its own asset class, you know, kind of like gold and the crypto economy will be multiple asset classes and sub asset classes. 
But how do you see us going from here? And what are you looking forward to seeing in the years to come? What I'm looking forward to is um, seeing the digital payments sphere really, really uh, becoming popular. Because I think that uh, central bank uh, backed digital currencies uh, and a financial system that's not marginal like Bitcoin is today, but a financial system that is backed by the government and is backed by the banks that is based on blockchain and that is much more advanced. That's something I'm looking forward to because that will improve the efficiency and the cost efficiency for users as well as for companies um, of the whole financial system. And that's a much bigger thing than saying, I hope Bitcoin will become more popular. So do you think it's a narrative where the decentralized world just takes over the banking world and that's it, it's the end? <laughs> I think it'll be implemented. Blockchain will be implemented and will um, transform the banking system. I don't think the banking system will just disappear and, uh, and an alternative crypto uh, banking system will uh, rise in any way in the, in the next 20 years anyways. Cool. So do you see all the guys like Goldman Sachs who've been criticizing us eventually becoming our friends? Of course. <laughs> JP Morgan disrespected uh, blockchain at the beginning. Of course. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Listen, Avia, it was really fresh to see the world from your eyes and see it from a crypto lawyer who's open-minded and trying to push the space forward. For the guys watching out here, you definitely should uh, connect with Avia, Arika. Like, where, where, do you, where are you the most active and where should we follow you? Sure. So, you know, what I what I think, what I see around me today is a lot of confusion uh, because of all the new regulations and the, um, uh, the fact that the implementation is not clear and banks and with Wirecard now sort of uh, uh, with the Wirecard scandal, people are very confused. People are looking for solutions. And I think that people are not well informed enough in the industry in terms of the entrepreneurs. They're not well informed enough about the options. Uh, that uh, lie um, um, in front of them. Um, so I really think that it's important to be very focused on which markets, if you're an entrepreneur in this space, it's important to understand which markets you want to cater to in terms of, is it individuals? Is it small transactions? Is it businesses? Is it corporates? Which geographies are most important to you? What's your budget? Uh, what's your vision? Who's the people? Who are the people that are going to do it with you? And then sort of come to someone like me or a different lawyer and tell them, listen, find me the regulation or jurisdiction that will uh, be as smooth as possible for me. And that's completely what we're focusing on today. And I think that's very important to drive this industry forward. Avia Rika, you're definitely one of those cool crypto lawyers who's pushing the space forward. And guys, if you haven't downloaded the Swiss Board Wealth app, do not forget to do so. It's the only app on the planet that connects to multiple exchanges with just one account, gets you best rates in your local currency, and it's super easy to use. And if you are going to download the Swiss Board Wealth app, please use the reward link here below which is Avia Arika's reward link to thank her for coming, especially if you love today's content. All right, guys, so let's hope that one day all these regulators, all these lawyers will gather up, create this global sandbox with a clear template for smart contracts so that we can shoot a security across the planet without relying on an intermediary. If you like this interview, please do comment below, like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification and join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. Take care, guys. Thank you. Take care.